I am Todd Gitlin, Professor of Journalism and Sociology at Columbia University, and I approve this message. Okay. And um, from your perspective, uh, how did the media as a whole perform during the, the buildup to the war in Iraq? To generalize, the uh, media performed as they normally perform when it comes to the run-up to war. They are by and large credulous toward official claims. They are by and large scanty with analysis of the arguments that are made in behalf of war. They are in general scanty with the range of views that they permit to speak alongside officialdom. Uh, they are in general parochial and give short shrift to views from abroad, either from supporters, neutrals, or opponents. Uh, and uh, they have a, a memory span of about four seconds. Okay, and can you talk about, you know, why some of the factors of, of um, not covering debate why is it that there, it's not that there was a lack of debate, it's just that there wasn't being covered? The conventional idea among mainstream journalists is that their job when they cover Washington is to relay what officials say. They believe that that is their mission and that any other mission is an intrusion of, uh, of extracurricular concerns, as it were. Um, that is, they think that um, it is not incumbent upon them to press uh, questions which haven't already been pressed by people who are in the loop. And so when there are sharp disputes that come to the surface um, and come very close to the surface, uh, the media are willing to relay them. But in general, they think it's not their job, or rather they think it's a violation of their job to, uh, to promote uh, concerns, to raise questions, to, to broach uh, considerations which aren't already in play. It seems that uh, when there was controversy, they would say there is a controversy, but they wouldn't actually get into the substance of what the controversy actually was. Well, this goes along with the. It, it, it's. It's. Uh, I, I realize I have to right. rephrase what you said. Um, most. Can we talk specifically about television? You know, a, tele, a, 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 tel, a normal television news piece is, is, is of order of magnitude 60 seconds. Um, the average soundbite during a presidential campaign is now down to about nine seconds. Uh, sometimes a whole sentence is stripped of its beginning and end and reduced to a phrase that's inserted in the in the correspondence piece. In a sense, the, the talking heads are now uh, emitters of, of, of quotations uh, for the script uh, written by the narrator. So in this setting, um, everything is going to be compressed. We won't get exposed to the particulars of arguments. We'll be told, perhaps, at most, that there is an argument or that some, something has been called into question or that some view is controversial. Uh, which of course conveys no information, and uh, it's something that uh, many journalists uh, insert in order to clear their conscience before they move on. And I've talked to some news producers who say that the debate between France and the United States was very well covered, but when I asked them what to articulate the French position, they couldn't do it. Um, you know, that's a, it seems that 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 gets to exactly that point. Um, have you noticed that as well, that, that um, you have a lot of people who are, in this particular case, yelling at the French but can't actually say what the French position is? Are you talking about American officials or the reporters themselves? Uh, either the reporters or, um, you know, the, the officials certainly weren't art articulating the French. They were attacking them. Um, and, and it seems that some of the stories that the press were, co were doing we're saying, well, it's about oil. You know, they want the oil, but then as soon as it came to saying, well, why are we doing it? 
and that question wasn't uh, asked at all. Well, I'd, I'd have to go back and look at the pieces to, to recall exactly what, what they said about the French, but my, my memory, for what it's worth, is that you got the sense that what the French, the Germans, and others stood for was multilateralism as opposed to unilateralism. But what was the content of that multilateralism? What were they, you know, what kind of resolutions were they supporting at the, uh, at the Security Council? Were they saying no war ever or war as last resort? In fact, they were saying war as last resort. But I think most um, the the conventional um, um, idiot res, uh, uh, paraphrase, misparaphrase would be, you know, that that the French were uh, cowards, were uh, uh, tricksters, were uh, mindless delayers, and so on. You wouldn't get a sense of what the actual position was at the UN. Okay, great. And um, now you've said that uh, the beat reporters, they're kind of driven by the, the daily coverage and you've said before that they're you know they're uh, stenographers with amnesia can you talk about that's that Jack Newfield's phrase okay so can you just uh, uh, talk about the collective memory a little bit elaborate on that a little bit more of, of beat journalists there are we told them specifically about the White House beat um, or yeah we can focus on the White House beat yeah. I mean, uh, there are there are more or less knowledgeable White House reporters. Um, mainly, though, they take it as their responsibility to be, as uh, as Jack Newfield once said, stenographers with amnesia. Even if they do actually know something about the past, about the record of this or that official, about the policies of the government at other times, they don't regard it as as their job to uh, to uh, to uh, to remind us, the readers or the w viewers, of that. Um, and instead, they confine themselves to what they can get through their their precious access. Um, there are exceptions, and and there are some reporters who are better equipped than others. The boldest, like Dana Milbank of the Washington Post, get punished by the White House and lose what their bosses want above all them to have, namely access. Or they run that risk. And the White House was very clear with Milbank, who uh, who called distortions distortions and lies lies and misstatements misstatements, that uh, there's a price to be paid for being too rambunctious. Um, the uh, um, and and the uh, another problem with the White House beat reporter is that in general. Um, he or she isn't interested in what's on the public record. They're interested only in what's in front of their face. So uh, what's in front of their face uh, is uh, various evasions and uh, nonsensical on-message repetitions by the White House press office, um, rather than the evidence of what's in government documents, statistical abstracts, etc. cetera. Um, so what you're getting is a transcription of the surface. So do you see that the influence of public relations has, in fact, getting more sophisticated and more difficult for journalists to get their... I don't think there's anything very sophisticated about what, what the White House press people do. They go out there um, and they repeat themselves and they avoid questions and they declare um, like uh, servants of, of, of King, Kim Jong-il that uh, the president says this and the president says that. And, you know, it, does the president actually know anything about this or that? Well, it's not their business to, to say. The, this particular White House is remarkable in that the people who work in it don't even have a background in journalism in general, the people who work in the press office. They, they don't regard themselves as obliged to, uh, to mediate between journalists and the White House. They're, they're simply standing there stonewalling, uh, repeating empty slogans, and the White House uh, correspondents uh, often, not always, but often, are dutifully writing them down and, and repeating them. Now, again, uh, th this is a, a large generalization, and I don't want to say that journalists are often, uh, are, uh, sorry, I don't want to say that journalists in the White House are always doing nothing more than carrying water for the White House. Um, you get strong to moderate signs of rebelliousness from time to time. Uh, but the problem is that an, a note of skepticism 
never translates into the connecting of dots, the, the offering of an alternative theory as to what is really going on in the White House. For example, a theory of what was going on before the, 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 the war of March 2003 was that the Bush White House, Bush in particular, had been hell-bent on war uh, from uh, the beginning of that administration, hell-bent on war with Iraq. Um, that uh, they often changed the arguments that they put forward or put in first position in behalf of war but they did not um, consider contrary positions. That would have been a way of making sense of a great deal that was going on. And instead, the uh, White House correspondents felt it was their duty to repeat over and over again that the White House hadn't made up his mind, uh, that they were uh, still canvassing for evidence, that they were genuinely interested in the outcome, or at least some of them were genuinely interested in the outcome of the inspector's missions, and so on. So, yes, you can get traces of skepticism and a bit of insouciance, but it, is, it still represents a surrender to the overarching narrative that's put forward by the White House, rather than the offering to the viewers or readers of uh, a range of possible theories uh, as to what's going on. And, and, and journalists in general would bridle at the thought that what they're doing is relaying theories. Um, they, they would insist that all they're doing is excavating facts. But of course, the, the, the question of which facts one is attentive to and how one stresses them, oh, plays them up, plays them down, um, uh, uh, juxtaposes, them, juxtaposes them to okay, other sorry, facts. To, to shut yeah, down. yeah. Juxtaposes, juxtaposes them to other facts, uh, includes uh, or, or excludes or uh, frames, etc. Uh, journalists would be uh, at journalists would be um, uh, loath to acknowledge that uh, that uh, th these are necessities of the trade. So there is a, a sort of clean hands assumption, which uh, violates uh, common sense, but is the um, the profession's understanding of what it itself is doing, and it's an obscurantist understanding, but there it is. And uh, it seems through a lot of what you're saying is that uh, they're reporting the events, but you know they're not really addressing the why aspect of the who, what, when, why, why, and how. That the why is something that is to this day largely left unanswered by the media to, to informing the public. You have to make inferences as to why this happened since things were switching so much. So uh, can you give any insight as to which particular beat or if all beats should be trying to answer that question? Well, political reporting does have a conventional answer to the question why. And it is a cynical answer. The answer, the answer as to why for example, the president said this, or the majority leader said that, or the secretary of state said the other, is that he or she was positioning himself or herself for political advantage. So there, there is now a stock answer to the question why anybody does anything. And it has to do with um, the, uh, a sort of superficial unmasking. It's, it's the masking down to the next mask. Uh, which is, of course, the obvious one, that all politicians are self-seeking, which is part of the truth. But the, uh, the roundup of the background that uh, would, would, would give context to the sense of why, th why this conception of self and why not that one, it's, this is very shallow, and, uh, and, uh, and curiosity is, is truncated at a very early stage. Okay. Okay, and in some of your articles that uh, you've written, you talk, uh, you make analogies to the build-up as um, a sports, you know, the way that they're covering, you know, sports event. Can you elaborate on, on, on that point that you made? The networks are in the, are in the circulation business. Um, they want attention. It's an attention-getting industry. Attention is the valuable commodity that they sell to advertisers. 
And therefore, they are using all the devices that, uh, that uh, advertisers use to brand themselves and to rivet attention. They're using theme songs. They're using suspense build-up, showdown in the Gulf. Uh, they're, they're using um, the whole panoply of techniques to, to get attention. They're, they're using um, travelogue uh, features. They're using, I mean, much of, much of the coverage, so-called coverage of the war itself through embedded uh, reporters was, was travelogue. It was, you know, here we are, you know, on our way through the desert. I don't think the reporters who did that reporting were dishonest. Uh, I think that because of where they were, there was nothing else they could see or hear. Or, or hear. Uh, I'm sorry, I drifted away from your question. Well, I forget yeah, the, what it was. Um, and, and also, just uh, uh, I'm, I'm stopping before the war starts, so I'm not getting into m as much embedding issues. But mm -hmm. the, um, um, you talk about uh, if you say, for example, the UN Security Council, a lot of, of it, that coverage was uh, who's ahead, who's behind, mm -hmm. they're with yeah. us, they're against us, as opposed to a lot of the actual debates that were happening. So just. Kind of yeah. Well, no doubt one of the decisive moments in the run-up to the war was Secretary Powell's presentation to the Security Council uh, um, uh, in February of 2003 with, with, um, with George Tenet uh, seated as a prop behind him to certify the reliability of this intelligence. And uh, one was hard-pressed in the major American media to see scrutiny uh, skeptical scrutiny of his claims, although um, it wasn't entirely missing, but it was largely obscured. People were impressed by the encyclopedic nature. That was a word used by in the uh, in the New York Times report on page one the next day. The apparently encyclopedic nature of the uh, of, of the presentation. Um, the, um, the, the, the the this was this was a a um, an exercise in. Uh, horse race coverage. Um, it was the, like the coverage of a presidential campaign. How well did he do? What was his demeanor? Well, his demeanor was impressive. So, so journalists were impressed, but they weren't doing journalism. They were doing transcription. They were doing stenography. Um, and, uh, and it was very hard for the, uh, arg the, the arguments of criticism uh, to uh, to uh, recover and to uh, and to uh, uh, well, it was hard for the critical arguments to recover after that. And can you just elaborate on just the the basic tenets of journalism? To you know, basic or is it not to challenge power, to ask questions, and to <coughs> provide all the information to society in order to function as a democratic society? Well, the theory the re. The, uh, let me start again. The the reason the reason journalism has special protection in the in the U.S. Constitution. Uh, in the form of the First Amendment and the guarantee of the freedom of the press is because of a theory of the relation between information and democracy. And it is simply, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. You shall know the truth and therefore you'll be able to deliberate and therefore you will be able to govern yourselves and to hold your leaders accountable. The theory is baby simple. And uh, and the and so the 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 premise of uh, democratic theory is that the free flow of information is a better regulator um, than any government control can be, and it's, it, it, the regulation of information is the regulation of potential power. So. Um, insofar as the, uh, as the flow of information is clogged either by the malfeasance of the officials or the gullibility or self-censorship of, uh, of the journalistic uh, institutions or because of the uh, self-censorship of the public itself, which is after all free to transfix itself, to hypnotize itself into a gung-ho mood or an uncritical mood of other sorts, then, then the, this theory has been cracked. The theory's broken down and, uh, and democracy is crippled. And um, can you talk 
uh, a little bit about, um, you mentioned some of this in your articles, about uh, you know, the objectivity standard of, of giving the he said, she said viewpoint. And, and in some cases when uh, there is a, a right or wrong answer, sometimes the journalists are reluctant to actually dig deeper and to just kind of give both sides and that's it. Yeah, the, 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 the notion that one is discharged one's journalistic duty by reporting what two people have seen uh, or say they've seen or want you to know they've seen uh, is ridiculous. And we, we couldn't possibly usefully apply this to, um, um, to uh, everyday life. I mean, I'm, I'm reminded of the old gag about the, about the weather reports. They, they, they used to say things like, you know, there's an 80% chance of rain. And somebody is said to have gone down to the weather bureau and said, what do you mean by that? And the answer was, well, there are five of us here and four of us think it's going to rain. Um, you know, well, I think this and you think that. Well, meantime, the journalist has an obligation to exercise some authority. Um, and to know something about the situation which permits him to say, if facts warrant in his view, that while some people think it's going to rain, um, their track record is very poor on this. And uh, anyway, here's some information that they didn't take account of. Uh, and therefore, I come to the conclusion that uh, he said nonsense and she said nonsense, or he said half-truth and she said half-truth. But I, the journalist, am going to do better than simply transcribe what it is these people want you to believe. And um, can you talk about you know, what happens when uh, the Democrats and Republicans happen to agree on issues? Well, when Democrats and Republicans agree, uh, and all factions within these parties agree or, or are silenced, then, uh, then the debate collapses. I mean, then for, from the point of view of the he said, she said, transcriptive theory of journalism, there is no debate. There's nothing to talk about. And, we, and, and the circle of legitimacy has been compressed so that only those who fall within the consensus that's marked out by all of these, uh, by this chorus of agreement, uh, get a hearing. And, and so when you look back in this, this time period of the, the whole press, the, the print press and the television press, what do you, do you see that there were failures and what do you attribute those failures to? I think that the principal failure of the press in the run-up to the war was, the press and, and television, was in accepting the definition of the situation that was promoted from the Bush White House. And that meant uh, departing from uh, the standard of what really matters here in behalf of what does the administration say really matters here. And when you defer to the definition of the situation that's offered by the, the powerful, who are also the principal channelers of information, um, then you have already, uh, you have already surrendered uh, your autonomy. I mean, let me give you a, a, a simple linguistic example that it seems to me should have gotten uh, more attention. During the whole period in the run-up to the war and during the war itself, uh, we heard over and over again about the coalition. And the coalition was essentially the United States, Great Britain, and a, a few uh, 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 units from, from Costa Rica and a bunch of other countries. But the White House uh, continually uh, uh, brandished its list, its role of honor, uh, which listed a bunch of other countries, most of which were tiny and were offering very little, if any, help. Um, but somehow, um, over and over again, we were given the impression that, that what was being assembled to pursue the war was a coalition. Well, it, the, the coalition was a fig leaf for the United States of America, and it would have been honest to say so. It would have been reasonable to say, as some did in British reporting, for example, that it was a U.S.-U.K. force that was being mustered. Uh, there are various locutions to, to, with which to say this. But by over and over I I impressing upon the public the notion that the, the actor in this situation was the coalition, uh, the press was rubber stamping. Uh, one of the essential claims 
of the administrations itself. And by the way, I say this, what I'm saying I think holds whether you think the war was a good idea or not. It's a matter of intellectual honesty to, 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 to call things out as they are. And I think an honest defender of the war would also have had to admit that it was an American war um, or an American war with, a, with British adjuncts. Uh, but to call it a coalition was to borrow the prestige of Daddy Bush's coalition from the first Gulf War and for that matter the, uh, the language of allies and so on left over from World War II. Um, let's see, can you talk about um, bias in the media, uh, liberal bias, bias towards complexity, simplicity, and what do you see uh, about the biases of the media? All views of reality come from somewhere. Um, they are not born innocent. Um, they are not... Um, arbitrary. Um, they can be more or less accurate. They can be more or less comprehensive. Um, but there are many possible objective views of the same situation. I mean, you, you and I could describe this room truthfully and accurately, but differently because you're sitting there and I'm sitting here. So th there's nothing poisonous about the recognition that, uh, that honest and objective accounts of the world will diverge. And I think there's much to be said for striving toward comprehensiveness and uh, uh, the largest possible horizon with which or from which to understand what's, what's happening before us. Um, but when the world is simplified, as it necessarily is to some degree or other by any attempt to describe it, then there's an obligation uh, to be um, uh, full in one's treatment of it um, and to force, when, when it's a matter, for example, of arguments in, in behalf of war, it's, it's wise and democratically imperative to force the exponents of this view to confront the arguments of that view and to, conforce, and to force them to confront each other not at their weak points, so to store debaters' points, but at their strong points so that a citizen can be honestly uh, uh, educated. By this very high, I grant, criterion, uh, almost all television news coverage fails because of what it gives you is a cartoon. Um, uh, to speak of liberal bias is outlandish. There's much evidence uh, of the, uh, the impossible, um, impossibility of that claim, whether we're talking about how George Bush was treated during the 2000 campaign or the, the Florida recount or whether we're talking about the, uh, the treatment of Bill Clinton in office as opposed to George Bush in office. I mean, can you imagine what the media would be doing to Bill Clinton if somebody in his White House in, had outed a CIA agent? Can you imagine what, what, what would be the, the raking through his record that would be taking place? Can you imagine the leaks that would be spilling out from a, from a high, holy, grand inquisitor prosecutor? Can you imagine how much a daily attention would be, would be paid to the grand juries that are meeting on this matter as we speak? Liberal bias. This is a canard, this is a fraud that's been perpetrated by right-wing fanatics in order to bully the press into moving into their direction. Well, what I, from what I see is I see that when they look at these claims, they have sort of a confirmation bias. They don't do representative samples. They only find the evidence that confirms that belief. Of course. And it also seems that they are only looking at domestic issues and ignoring the implications of how they cover foreign policy issues. And so even then, only some domestic issues. I mean, yeah. so they, can you elaborate on, on that? The claim of liberal bias, insofar as evidence is ever adduced, is uh, generally resting on uh, surveys, unsystematic surveys, of the personal views of journalists. Now, journalism is done in institutions. It's not done by freelance uh, free thinkers. 
Uh, and uh, if it turns out to be true that in general, wouldn't be surprising since the headquarters of uh, most news organizations is in Manhattan, for example, that, uh, that the social views of journalists are uh, more liberal on questions like, uh, like abortion, like uh, gay rights, uh, etc., than, uh, than the American public as a whole. Um, if that turns out to be true, um, it doesn't speak to their views on economic questions which reflect their class identity, which is prosperity, high prosperity, and therefore uh, it doesn't uh, militate against the fact that on economic issues they may well be conservative. And secondly, the presumption is that, that television broadcasts are uh, unmediated loudspeaker system for the private views of the, of the, uh, of the journalists. Uh, which is nonsense. Journalists work in an organization. The, the editors are giving them instructions. The, the, um, uh, the producers are uh, cutting, uh, editing the pieces. Um, I've, I've talked to television journalists, network journalists, who are proud of the fact that their own grandmothers couldn't tell from their report what side of an issue they were on, if any. Uh, so this is, uh, this is a, a, a nonsensical, but amply repeated uh, and, uh, and therefore widely credited view. And uh, can you talk about the, uh, the editorial process and from your viewpoint, what were the editors of the television news, um, ABC, CBS, and NBC, the broadcast television news, what did they see as important stories to, to put as the headline, the top news? Story? You mean in the run-up to the news, the right. run-up to the war? Right. Um, could you do me a favor? Is there any water in that glass over oh, there? Yeah, there's a little bit. Yeah, a little, a little bit will help. No, this is okay. Um, I'm sorry. Um, okay, so um, what was the? Uh, what were some of the? The, the, the uh, well, I guess um, when I talked to Andrew Tendall, he his uh, the Tendall report, he basically said that this entire buildup was call, you know covered as a military intervention, and that. You know, whenever information would come out that you know would would give us any idea as to when the war exactly was going to start, was valuable information. Enterprise reporting seemed to be centered around that. So, just your comments on what the editors and also the journalists were looking for in the, the build up to the war in Iraq. There was an obsession with tactics. I'm sorry. Okay, go ahead. There, there was an obsession with tactics. Um, I'm, I'm reminded about the first Gulf War when uh, a friend of mine at Berkeley, I taught at Berkeley, then a historian of Islam, was, was asked to, to come on a radio program. And um, he did. And, uh, and, and the only thing they wanted to know from him is, when is the ground war going to start? Uh, he's not a military guy. He's a historian of Islam. Um, there was a similar sort of obsession this time with the minutia of uh, military matters. As soon as uh, war be was recognized to be imminent, uh, the questions under discussion ceased to be political questions, ceased to be questions about diplomacy, ceased to be questions about the relation between Saddam Hussein and al-Qaeda, the question of weapons of mass destruction and so on, and became tactical questions about uh, positioning. So when, for example, to, just one that comes to mind, when the Turkish government uh, decided not to permit the United States to, oh, it's, it's going to, it'll stop soon. Okay, yeah. Um. I think that's it. When the Turkish government uh, decided not to permit the United States to uh, invade uh, Iraq from the north, from Turkish territory, we got no sense of what was in play in Turkish politics. Uh, this was simply uh, framed as a betrayal of American desires, which would have certain military consequences. But it wasn't a political story. Uh, the political experts disappear and are displaced by the military experts, who of course are in general retired uh, generals and admirals uh, who, uh, who know very little, uh, or at least have no particular expertise. Uh, on uh, questions of, 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 of political ramification, for example, which was always the central question at stake in Iraq. And, uh, 
the uh, when you say it, when it became a transition from a political to a military issue, do you have a a sense of a time frame of, of when that happened? No, not I don't remember. I'll just throw out some you know, dates. Like on November eighth, the resolution fourteen forty one was passed, and that allowed the inspectors to go back in. And there seemed to me to be uh, a blurring of what Negroponte Ponte actually said in the council meeting, which was that there was no automaticity and no hidden triggers for war, which is what the French were actually using. The American statements. Yeah, on the, the French record. wanted a second resolution. Yeah. Right, they wanted that second resolution. And that when the, the uh, Pentagon correspondents covered this, you have David Martin saying that, you know, now President Bush wants to go all the way to Baghdad. You know, so to them, I think that seemed to be, uh, and, and Campbell Brown said, now uh, Bush has received a, a blank check for military action, which is what was, wasn't an accurate representation of what the resolution was about. But to me, the media kind of interpreted that first resolution uh, the Bush administration was saying, we don't need another resolution, and they took that as gospel and said, okay, we're going to war. Yeah, the, uh, the journalists accepted the official Washington interpretation of every crucial event, including, for example, the passing of Resolution 1441 by the Security Council. So uh, then history began for them with the White House interpretation. And to go back to the resolution's actual wording, uh, to consult with other officials, with, with, with representatives of other governments, or with the UN apparatus itself, would have been considered irrelevant, was considered irrelevant. Um, history collapsed. Uh, uh, the multiplicity of the world collapsed. And the sole question brought forward was of the American interpretation. And it also seemed that there were a lot of questions that could have been asked about this entirely new national security policy. Um, and I think you mentioned this, is that there was virtually no discussion you about... You mean the 2002? Uh, yeah, this September of 2002. Yeah. But, uh, but it was about to be implemented for the first time. You know, this, this petri dish of, of new foreign policy uh, is about to occur, occur, but there seems to be no sense of... No. You know, I, I I have written about it a lot. Um, I I but I don't recall what tell. I mean, I imagine television did very little with it, but, but I really don't remember precisely. So I, okay. I shouldn't. Yeah, it's, I, guess I, it, I shouldn't talk. I about guess the uh, it's a sin of omission in a way that, it, to my extent, it wasn't one of many. So <laughs> yeah, can you just talk about that of uh, the sins of omission of the television news? Television news, uh, when it chooses can pay close attention to documents and their, om their omissions, their distortions, their uh, irreconcilability with other documents and so on. But um, uh, there's a kind of habit of submissiveness that prevents them from saying, wait a minute, how does this document square with that document? Um, you know, the Bush national security strategy of 2002 speaks about the necessity of, uh, of, um, of what they call preemptive war. Um, now, preemption uh, for preemption to, to be uh, in play, uh, there has to be an imminent threat. What's the evidence that there actually is an imminent threat? Um, you know, a, a fair reporting of what's about to take place would, uh, would refer backward to the claims and arguments of the prior document, which, was, which had the, the force of executive proclamation, uh, and not just to be obsessed with the latest uh, revelation of the 24-hour news cycle. But the, um, the refusal to go backward is a grant of plenipotentiary powers to those who are, uh, who are uh, spewing the, um, you know, the, the line of the day from the White House. And uh, so the, 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 the compressed attention span um, ends up serving power. And um, when you say there has to be an imminent threat, um, I've seen enough conservative arguments that they would say, if you look at the public record of the Bush administration, they never actually said the two words, imminent threat. So, um, yeah, they were careful not to say the words imminent threat, the mushroom cloud and all this. I mean, let's get serious here. Uh, the, uh, well, the, 
what I'm asking specifically is that is that imminent threat uh, standard. Does that where does that come from? Does it come from international law? Does it come from uh, something that's already existing somewhere? Uh, or how how was it that the the press was report were the press were actually saying imminent threat? And from my viewpoint, the administration may have not been saying they may have been applying it, but when it was was it because it was being reduced um, by the journalist to say imminent threat? Well. That's an interesting question, and I don't know the answer. Um, if the White House never spoke the words imminent threat, it was because they were being extremely careful not to, just, just as they rarely uh, said in so many words that Saddam Hussein uh, was so intimately involved with al-Qaeda to have been directly involved in the attacks of September 11th. They never exactly said it, but that's not the way they operate. They operate with a hum of implication and a shadow of uh, well, I'll just leave it at that. They operate with a hum of implication and uh, and leave it to an emotionally gripped and largely uncritical and inattentive audience to follow out the implied logic of their declarations. And I guess this is something that it, it's really difficult for the media to uh, listen to a, uh, 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 a speech by President Bush. And if they are in fact contriving these implications that they want to send out there without ever explicitly saying so, and then you have the effect of public opinion being affected by people thinking that there's a connection between Saddam Hussein and, and Al Qaeda. You know, how is the media? How are they supposed to counter this nonstop insinuations that are occurring? It's very easy to counter insinuations. You call attention to the fact that the insinuation is there, and you examine it. I mean, sports announcers don't have any trouble imputing intentions, strategies, and tactics to basketball coaches. You know, well, it's clear that the, uh, you know, they're, they're doing poorly on defense, so now uh, we're going to see them uh, fold into this sort of defensive deployment. I mean, this is done all the time. Um, uh, motives are imputed to people ordinarily, as I, as I was saying before, the, there's characteristically the imputation that all politicians are doing is improving their own standing. Um, um, so uh, it's not hard to do. It's not hard to call uh, these things uh, into question, but it takes the ability to resist the conventional wisdom, the pack mentality, and the habit of submission. And speaking to the pack mentality of journalism, there seems to be some advantages and some disadvantages to, to that. Can you speak to, you know, what are some of the, the costs and the benefits of journalism well journalists are like members of any profession I mean there sh there needs to be uh, it's true for doctors who resisted it. it's it's true for other uh, academics uh, other groups academics for example there's a there's a desire to um, uh, to want to 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 achieve the ratification of one's peers um, that one's peers are the implied audience of what one does and um, sometimes that leads to the elevating of standards. Um, at other times, however, it leads to the depressing of standards uh, and the unwillingness to stick out so that if one, uh, you know, if one is a reporter from a mid-sized paper or a lesser wire service and reports X or Y, one might well find the editor uh, saying, well, you know, if this is such a great story of this is so important, you know, how come the New York Times, the Washington Post, and the Wall Street Journal don't have it? Um, uh, and so uh, often enough, there is this, this uh, uh, flattening effect, which works against the high end of peer review and in favor of uh, a sort of meltdown of, uh, of individuality and of uh, variety. And during the build-up to the war, you know, I was actually present at a lot of the anti-war rallies and we was hearing a lot of the, you know, both the, uh, uh, the more off-topic uh, discussions that were happening at the rallies and the more on-topic discussions. And there seemed to be uh, a mixture 
uh, granted, uh, uh, but also that there were legitimate analytical analysis, you know, compressions of what was happening that seemed to be, uh, in, in hindsight, very prophetic of, of what was about to happen, why it was happening. And, you know, can you speak to why there seemed to be a, uh, not a lot of coverage of the substance of the anti-war rallies and uh, trying to pick out um, what they were actually saying? The media mainly view protest activity as a photo op as the opportunity to relay a, um, an impression of the sort of people these are. But they, the, the demonstrators are in general held to be embodiments of angles or positions rather than articulators of arguments. Um, therefore, there's more attention paid to their dress than to their views. There's more attention paid to what's on their face than what's in their head. And uh, this is, this is uh, not an exception, but closer to a rule. And can you talk to, uh, overall, the influence of imagery and images in television news and how that drives their coverage? Well, again, if we understand that the major thing that television news is, is trying to do is to collect attention, then uh, imagery is the prime means they have at their disposal. And of course, anybody who wants to get on television is going to exploit the desire for the photogenic. So the Bush people are going to set up uh, a proscenium arrangement of Bush arriving on the aircraft carrier uh, to declare that the mission is accomplished. Um, they're going to produce what one of Reagan's people once called our little playlets. And the media, of course, are in the business of, um, uh, of uh, accepting their definition of the photogenic and letting them produce these little playlets, letting them set the stage at the very least. Uh, there's a collaboration in short. There's a desire on the part of the the uh, the politicians to uh, to arrange the show, and there's ordinarily a desire on the part of the news media to relay the show. They both have, they share an interest in the show. They share an interest in um, in uh, making something magnetic. Uh, now, journalism isn't always stuck with that, and there's a lot of restiveness. There's a lot of disgruntlement about the. Um, surrender to the uh, the public relations strategies of uh, of the politicians and journalists uh, often talk about how to crack the habits the bad habits of uh, of uh, servility which have become uh, the pronounced uh, features of their trade. There's a there's a good deal of embarrassment when when they do surrender. But nonetheless, there's a momentum, there's inertia um, that works in direction of submission. And, uh, you know, reporters in general will not be fired for uh, their dutiful reproduction of the, uh, of the display put on by the authorities. They might well get into trouble if they deviate from, from it or if they call call it too closely into question if they uh, if they undo the curtain to show uh, that there's a funny little guy on a box speaking through an amplifier. And, um, okay, the um, um, during the month of uh, starting in February or so, maybe even in uh, sometime in, in January, but really in February and March there seemed to be a lot of uh, enterprise reporting or, you know, uh, Pentagon correspondence, but not from the Pentagon, but they're covering military exercises or more for training. Uh, can you talk about, you know, some of those very salient images that were during that, that time period? Well, as, as the war approaches in general, um, and the story ceases to be, if it was in the first place, political, and begins to be military. Then, for a variety of reasons, the attention uh, moves to the logistics of training and preparation and, and location. Uh, 
One reason is obviously that the definition of the story is now military. But a second is the belief that the bond between journalists and their public uh, rests on the public's belief that the journalists have the best interests of the troops at heart. And therefore, the actual physical being of the troops be becomes central to the story. Um, so these two motives converge. I mean, there's really not any contradiction between them. And the upshot is that the uh, maneuvers of the troops take center stage. Is it, I mean, are, is what you're trying to say also that to, a way to humanize the story? Or, um... Well, it does put faces on the story, and the faces are necessarily uh, given the conventional definition of news going to be the faces of our guys. Okay. And, let's see. Um, and can you uh, talk a little bit about, uh, you know, speaking towards the, uh, the uh, print press, you know, what is your, uh, you kind of did an audit of the op-ed pieces, um, and, and what is your evaluation of the uh, leanings and, and, and the nature of the debate within even the op-ed pages? It's a curious thing. Um, often uh, people who take a distant view of journalism and don't look at it closely tend to think of it as all of a piece. Uh, but it isn't. We're talking about several institutions, often with competing and even clashing interests, that operate under the same roof. So we had for, you know, this very interesting phenomenon. He was the Washington Post that was repertorially rambunctious and um, um, forward with, uh, with scrutiny of uh, White House claims, uh, at least at times, but uh, editorially was uh, quite devoted to the righteousness of the war, and whose uh, op-ed page, instead of conveying a, a reasonable sampling of uh, views for, against, neutral with respect to the war was heavily skewed for the war. Then we had the New York Times, which was editorially anti-war, uh, but whose, uh, whose reporting was far more submissive, meek, uh, and uh, flat, uh, un unambitious, uh, uh, all coexisting within the same newspaper. But I, I actually did a count of the, uh, the op-ed balance um, in the uh, Washington Post uh, in the run-up to the war, and it was outlandishly pro-war. Okay. Um, let's see. Can you talk a little bit about you know news as entertainment and uh, just the nature of, of Nielsen ratings and on on average you know the sizes of, of the television news? The the network news audiences have come down considerably since the the oligopoly that they shared in the 1960s and today um, you know their their numbers cluster around 15 or so million per evening um, per network. Uh, now, it's important to recognize that as, as, as much as the numbers have come down and as heavily age-skewed they are toward the elder, uh, still far, many, far more people are watching the evening news than watching cable news. And when cable news gets a lot of attention from other journalists and others and people of, 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 of politically engaged stripe, uh, but just to put the numbers in some sort of perspective, cable news, all the cable news networks put together, amalgamate to roughly a million and a half, two million viewers at any given time during the day, uh, uh, as compared to the 40 to 50 million viewers of the three big network news broadcasts. So uh, I think that gives you some idea of the relative significance. The numbers are coming down. The, age, the average age of the television, uh, the network, major network news uh, viewer is, uh, you know, is, is, on the, uh, is on the far side of 50. And you can see it by the commercials. <laughs> and, and talk a little bit about the, the, the commercials within, uh, you know, do you, do you see that there's, 
Well, I, that's a, that's an off topic, you know, th just because uh, most of the commercials were pharmaceuticals and not really to the um, the war. Uh, and, uh, well, what, any thoughts on the advertising and any influence of what is or is not covered? I think uh, the influence is um, is indirect. Um, the the networks assume that they can pick up the older viewers. Uh, so they're competing at the margin for younger viewers, and particularly younger women who were the hardest for them to reach. Uh, and therefore, this, this tilts them toward softer news, toward health stories and celebrity stories and so on. But th that's the influence, that's the only influence I'm aware of from from advertising slash demographic calculation. And can you talk about the nature of investigative reporting within television news? Uh, specifically to this topic or like That's it. Of? What is there to say? <laughs> um, there, there are very few people in uh, network uh, news okay, broadcast. There was a shift, so. Okay. There are very few uh, professionals uh, who do regular investigative reporting on the evening news broadcast. Now, there is a very important role played by the networks in their magazine shows, especially 60 Minutes. Um, the, the role of 60 Minutes, for example, in retailing the, the Abu Ghraib photographs is well known. Um, and, uh, and that's important. Uh, we would be uh, far worse off without 60 Minutes, an extraordinary phenomenon, a great achievement uh, for CBS. Long may it prevail. Um, the other network uh, news magazines, uh, nothing to write home about. Okay, and um, you know, David Martin uh, won the, uh, an award from Columbia University for his re uh, reporting uh, or at least it was sponsored with the DuPont Award uh, for, you know, he broke a lot of stories like the shock and awe, you know, story. And can you speak to... What was the shock and awe story? Well, that we're going to drop, you know, all these cruise missiles. Oh, on. in advance. Right, in advance. So he, so in other words, it seems that, uh, that the Pentagon reporters are reported or rewarded for um, reporting on this. And when I asked, you know, Lawrence Grossman, you know, why... You know, he said, well, it's not his job to ask why. It's not the Pentagon Beats question, you know, job to ask why this is happening. So if that's true or if it's not true, then whose job is it to ask why? It's, it, it's any journalist's job to ask why. Um, I think there should be a strong, I think there should be awards for beat journalism that goes beyond the ordinary and goes to probing and I I historical inquest and, um, uh, and out of the ordinary curiosity. I think that's the sort of beat reporting that should be rewarded. Because it's ordinarily not rewarded by the editors or producers, uh, may not be rewarded by the audience, which may you know, want to cut to the chase and watch the juicy stuff that bleeds. But it's the acme of the profession, and it needs to be cherished. And, and so what do you see is rewarded, and um, what kind of journalism is rewarded? You know, I'd have to look and see who's won the. I mean, the the, the Dupont award, the Dupont awards uh, have have gone to some wonderful long form television uh, productions like uh, the um, uh, what's the name of their company, um, Brooks Lapping Company of uh, Britain, which I wrote an article about also for the American Prospect. But I don't I don't pay attention to their uh, prizes for ordinary. Uh, Beat coverage, so I don't know what they okay. reward. Um, let's see. Okay, let me see everything here. Do you have any other last thoughts about you know television news in, in general uh, leading up to the war in Iraq? As you were watching it, any thoughts that were coming to your mind like stick out?
Not really. No? Okay. <laughs> great. That's real great. Uh, okay. Actually, before... Well, wait. Let me just... Uh, uh, Bill Moyer's um, Illusions of the News, and I mm. you know, see that you're, you're featured in that. And, and one of the statements that Leslie Stahl is saying that she wants to wallpaper her stories with images and pretty pictures right. and actions. Can you speak to, you know, that nature of, of the, the need for journalists to kind of wallpaper their stories? Again, this it, it, the conventional approach to the visual nature of television uh, is very unimaginative. Um, but it is an article of faith in the networks that backgrounds should be something. Uh, cute, stimulating, consonant with the impression that's being conveyed by the by the crowd, by by the by the characters, um, uh, and therefore journalists are imprisoned by the stage setting, the the prop deploying uh, by the uh, on the part of the uh, proprietors. Th therefore, um, you know we've got this idiotic uh, format that's now become normal in p political speeches of, of plastering the backdrop with a slogan, you know. Builds five body, five you know builds strong bodies five ways uh, you know peace and freedom you know war is peace um, it's an exercise in duplicity uh, but but the this I think unexamined um, notion that the object of journalists is to maintain a uh, modicum of visual interest and visual interest here is defined very narrowly. I think it, it cramps imagination and it leads to this scene setting which is uh, I think diabolical. Okay, great. Let's do um, a little bit of room tone.